All right. Hey, um, we are uh, continuing the series called The Good Life. That's what we want you to have. That's what God wants you to have. Jesus said, I came to give you a more abundant life, a better life than you ever dreamed of. We want that for you more than anything. And, I mean, if you don't want that, I don't, you know, I don't know. But, but everybody should want a better life. Um, we also want all of you, and I get, we always have people here don't know God, don't understand. We want all of you to get to know God as love and have a personal relationship with him. If you do, you'll never be the same. And I promise if you do, if you come and check him out, you will have that and it'll change everything. So I'm excited you're here. Um, last week we began and talked about um, that everything great starts with prayer. And we challenged you to try to pray throughout the week and to take your prayer life to a whole other level. Today, I want to go a, a little bit deeper here. Uh, and what we're going to talk about today, more than anything, and I was up all night thinking about this. I, what we're going to talk about today, at the end of this message, if you apply to your life, I really believe is the maybe greatest gift that you can give your marriage and your kids and your family. And I really believe that, and I hope that if this isn't part of your life or whatever, you will apply it to your life, and I'm sure you will be blessed if you do. So I'm excited, but I hope God speaks to you. Most importantly, I hope you will apply this to your, to your life. I want to begin and, again, build a foundation here, uh, share with you something that my mentor shared. I've been blessed to have incredible mentors, and one of my mentors was the head of a Christian counseling center, and he shared this once, and anytime this guy speaks, I listen. He's been such a blessing in, in my life. And he, he was talking about, he said, I want to talk about the greatest sin there is. And he had my attention because I, I don't know what he's talking about. It was not the unpardonable sin. Some of you are familiar with that in Scripture. It was not that. So he says, this is the greatest sin there is. He had my attention. He said, and I believe out of this sin call, comes all other sin. And I was like, what is it? What is it? And what he was talking about was pride. Pride is the greatest sin there is. And out of, out of pride comes all other sin. Here's the big deal. This is our first point. Pride always keeps you from God. Think about that. And it always keeps you from God's best. All right? And, and I want you to think about that. See if you agree. Pride is what keeps everyone from God. Right? I don't need God. And, and it definitely keeps everyone who already believes in God's following God from God's best. Okay? Here's what the Bible says about pride. God opposes the proud. He's actually against you if you're walking around pride. But he gives grace to the humble. And then what about this? We all should be afraid. We're all one, one bad decision away from losing everything. Pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit, which means a superior spirit or an arrogant spirit, bef spirit before a fall. Nothing will keep you from this better life that God wants to give you, more abundant life, than pride. Than pride. And we've seen this in church. You've seen it. We know in this church that God can heal any marriage can put any marriage back together. But if you're like, well, I'm not going to do the work. I'm not going to ask God for his help. I'm not going to make him the foundation of my marriage. Then God can't do that work. And that's pride. There is no addiction that God can't overcome and help you to overcome one day at a time. But if you're not going to seek God's help and do the work, the hard work of recovery, then God can't help you to overcome an addiction. Um, I see this one. This is a big one. All right? Um, this is not easy, following God. Life is not easy. And so there are times, if you exhaust all resources, that it would be a good idea to go to Christian counseling. And I see all the time people like, well, I'm not doing that. Well, that is pride, all right? And, and sometimes that is necessary. And I stand before you, my marriage is one of the toughest parts of my journey. Me and my wife have to work very hard at our marriage. It doesn't come easy to us. And we've been to Christian counseling many times. And we would not be married without Christian counseling. So you got to watch out for pride. Pride will always keep you from God and God's best. And God loves you so much He'll try to break this down in you. And here, here's what he does. Here's my term for it. I call it, he takes you to the woodshed. All right? And if you don't know what that means, think about it this week or ask somebody. But he'll take you to the woodshed. He's trying to get your attention and break the pride in your life. The weird thing for me is I wrote this message. I'm talking about this. And after I wrote the message Friday night, he took me to the woodshed. It was just me and him. It's like, okay, God. And I've been trying to grow ever since and work on it. Here's what happened. I went to a meeting, a recovery meeting on Friday night, 
And ironically, the topic that was brought up was about asking for help and how we, you know, that's part of life, asking for help and about pride and about pride. So they're going around sharing and this new guy shares and he goes, yeah, you know, I'm new around here and pride's something I'm trying to work at. He goes, but uh, be honest, it's really hard for me because I've done a lot of great stuff. <laughs> and I just started laughing at the guy. Unfortunately, uh, trying internally, but a guy that goes to this church, who I love, I've known the guy before I was a Christian, he saw me, I was snickering. And God just kicked my butt. It's like, look at you, man. I had more pride than the guy did. Me laughing at him. And God just took me to the woodshed. And he'll do that. That's how we grow. And so always got to watch out for pride. I hope this week you will look at your life and say, God, where do I need to be more humble? Help me, God, to be more humble. And when pride comes up, make me aware of that. All right? And it, it's so important uh, to growing. Um, so here, here's another thing that happened that taught me a little bit about this. Uh, first of all, if, if you're going to overcome pride, you need to be willing to ask people for help. You need to be willing to ask God for help. That's the most humble thing you do is pray and ask God for help. And you need to be willing to ask other people for help. When you ask other people for help, uh, one, you may get help. God may use them to help you. Two, you may bless them by being able to help you. Sometimes the blessing is supposed to be for them, but, and it's pride that will stop that from happen, happening. Here's a story. About a year ago, my daughter wanted a puppy. All right, my daughter is a great kid. She's very good with animals, and um, we were to season her. Her dream was to have a puppy, and I caved in because I'm a dad and I have a daughter. Are you with me, dads? You know, and and so these people at church had a puppy, and she kept talking about it and talking about it, and so she talked me into it. So I believe it was Monday, which is my Sabbath, and we went to meet them for this puppy. And the whole day, remember, we talked about this in the series. I was in the flesh. You know what that means? I mean, I wasn't right with God. I was a little irrit irritable and stuff, and I was in the flesh. All right, we're going to go get this dog. Well, we go to get the dog, and I'm supposed to meet them here to do this family thing, get the dog that I'm already on the fence about. And the people, and they're from this church, and they were late. They called and said, hey, we're late, you know, and we're running late. And so I start getting all honked off. Oh, now, oh, now you're messing with my time. Brr, and... Then they call back, oh, sorry, it's going to be another whatever amount of time, and I'm just getting all ticked off. Finally, at about a half hour late, I get all mad, and I'm like, I'm not doing this. I'm, not, I'm leaving. And I said, this doesn't feel right to me, honey, and I'm not getting a dog that doesn't feel right. And, and I left the parking lot. Any of you do jacked up stuff like this or just me, right? I left the park. yeah, just me. And so my daughter calls, and she's in tears, and my my wife's on her team, not supposed to be on teams, right? My wife's on her team, and, um, and I'm the bad guy. So then I come back. It wasn't God's conviction that brought me back. It was my daughter's conviction that brought back. And finally they showed up with a dog, and, and they could tell I was, I, was, I was in a mood, you know what I mean? And, and um, like, Dad, can we go ahead and get it? And I'm like, sure. And, um, you know, it used to be. When I was a kid, I felt like all the time you could get a dog for free or for like 25 bucks. It's not that way anymore. I don't know if you knew that. And so dogs are usually, even at some shelters, like 100 bucks or whatever. But these people from the church insisted that we take this dog for free. It was the kind of dog that my daughter wanted. And it's ended up being an incredible blessing. And almost missed the boat because of pride. So I got a picture of her dog. That's a little puppy. That's a really wild-looking little dog. And then here it is at uh, about a year. That's her dog. That's about 115 pounds. It's a big dog. And honestly, it's a great dog. And these, so the dog has been such a blessing, and we almost missed that because of pride. Well, my dog is named Fred, and my dog has gotten really old really fast. And I love my dog a lot, but she can't get in the car anymore to go walk with me. I love walking with my dog. I love going places. She can't get in the car. It's hard for her to get in bed. It's sad, you know. But I'm like, dude, I'm 50 years old, and this period between here and 60, I want a dog. 
I want a buddy. I want a fishing buddy. And so for, I was thinking for weeks and months, I'm going to get me a puppy. And, and I decided I was going to get a puppy. And so my daughter's like, well, just call the girl from church. And I'm like, not going to do that. Nope. And my wife's like, call the girl. Not going to do that. I'm going to find me a puppy. And I want a chocolate lab. So I am looking all over. If you don't know, it's not like legal or some weird thing to put dogs on Craigslist. So that's not a place. It's very hard to find in a cheap dog, a good dog, cheap dog. So Craigslist is not, I'm looking all over trying to figure out how to get a dog. There's a thing I discovered after hours and hours and hours of research called Hoobly. Anybody ever heard of Hoobly? It's like Craigslist, only you are allowed to list dogs on there. So I get on Hoobly, and I'm looking for a chocolate lab. And I mean, I'm spending so much time, I'm willing to drive to Cleveland or Indianapolis or Detroit, wherever, to get this dog. I get on Hoobly, and here's a chocolate lab, puppy for 200 bucks, and listen to this. The name of the, the people, there's a little name on this Hoobly, it's your, it's your name you call yourself, is Faith in Us. Oh, God wants me to have this. This is ordained by God. As soon as I saw faith in us, I'm like, oh, God's speaking to me. This is my dog. So faith in us. So I'm like, um, um, wow, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to check this out. So as soon as faith in us, I sent, you have to sign up for this account. And I'm like, this stinks. I don't know if I'm going to get a bunch of emails. I don't know about all this. But I signed up for, the, for an account to faith in us. And I said, hey. My name is Mike Berry, and I live in the Dayton, Ohio area, and I am so excited about this chocolate lab. Please get with me as soon as possible. I will go and pick this dog up, okay? And so five minutes later, I get a response back from Hoobly, and the response said, is this Pastor Mike? <laughs> it was the same girl from our church. It was her. And God took me to the woodshed. And, and I'm not so sure when we went to get this puppy, I was late. Are you with me, church? So God will humble you, and it's beautiful. Humble yourself, all right? So do you know what the Bible says? James 4.10. This is the most, I hope you'll memorize this. Can we get James 4.10 up here? I want all of you to memorize this. This is one of the most powerful scriptures in the Bible. Let's read this on three. One, two, three. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Listen, this is how God works. If you humble yourself before the Lord, God, I need your help, he can and he will help you. If you don't humble yourself, God can't and won't help you. Humble yourself before the Lord. Remember that. And every day, pray, God, help me to be humble so that you can be lifted up. So I want to tell you a great story that you may not be familiar with in the Bible about humility. It paints a picture that I just love. I want to throw this in. Jesus tells a story in Luke. It says, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else. Now, any of you wrestle with that? I bet every day people tend to, can look down on other people's small little subliminal thought or something. Uh, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. These were the holy rollers. They thought they had it all together. They dressed like real followers of God, thought they were real, act like real followers of God. And the other was a tax collector. This was like the lowest of lows in the day of Jesus, a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. Notice that. He prayed about himself. And here's what he prayed. God, I thank you that I'm not like those guys. Thank you, God, that I'm not like them robbers and evildoers and adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Not me, God, thank you. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. And, and, and that was his prayer. And Jesus is telling this parable. He says, but this tax collector, uh, he went to pray, and he couldn't even look up to heaven because he knew who he was. He understood the relationship with God. And he said, he just beat his chest and said, God, have mercy on me. Have mercy on a sinner like me. And Jesus said, I tell you this, that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. And then it ends with this powerful line, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. 
God will take you to the woodshed. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. And this is how God works, that we humble ourselves. And I want you to this week pay attention to that. Um, my son uh, is now, he's on a list, a list of people review messages. And he's 19 years old, and without Christ, he wouldn't have been born because me and my wife would have been divorced. And God did a miracle, and so we have this, this kid. And um, he, he, uh, he shared two nuggets uh, in this message. He said, you need to add this, these two things, and they were powerful. And here's one. It's about John the Baptist, all right? And if you don't know, and I, I, I really didn't know this. I studied this much more in depth this week. So John the Baptist, like, was he big? The big deal about John the Baptist was he was the first prophet in hundreds of years. And it's like, this John the Baptist was a big deal. And everybody was following him. And he was baptized. And they're like, man, John, the, where'd this cat come from? He is from God. And everybody's following John the Baptist. Well, all of a sudden, this other dude comes on the stage. And everybody starts following this other dude. Do you know who the other dude was? A dude named Jesus. Well, all the people were like, John the Baptist, aren't you ticked off? All these people are getting baptized by Jesus now. They're, don't you care? And John the Baptist said, this is awesome. He said, uh, no, that, that the joy is mine and it is now complete. This is what my life is all about. This is what all of our lives are all about. And here's what he said. He must become greater. I must become less. I challenge all of you to say that prayer every day this week. God, may you become greater. May I become less. That's what it really means to follow Christ. We no longer live for ourselves. But may you become greater. And may I become less. I want to live for your glory now, God. Powerful. By the way, this is why a study Bible is important. The note here says, John's willingness to decrease in importance shows unusual humility. And if you at all think of yourself as a leader in any way for the kingdom, listen to this. Pastors and other Christian leaders can be tempted to focus more on the success of their ministries than on Christ. Beware of those who put more emphasis on their own achievements than on God's kingdom. God, may we become less and you become more. That's what it means to follow Christ. So uh, we humble ourselves before the Lord and he will lift us up. How do we do that? Here's three steps. Uh, number one, the first step is just prayer. We talked about, it. you know, prayer is the most humble thing you can do if you think about it, because we're saying, I, there is a, some God, I'm praying to something and I need your help. There's something greater than me. So we pray. What do we pray for? This is how you know you're growing. At first you pray, uh, God, do this for me. <laughs> I want this, God, do this for me. As you grow spiritually, you learn what to pray for, and you begin to pray for God's will, right? We humble ourselves by praying and then seeking God's will in all we do. Now, that's the key. We pray for God's will in all we do. Many of us at first, God, I would like you to help me in my finances now, please, but I will take care of my sex life, right? Or God, I would like you to take care of this part of my life, but I'm going to take care of all these parts. Once we become real followers and we grow, we see that God wants what's best for us in all areas of life. We cross the line, and from now on, we're supposed to pray for God's will in all areas of our life. We have a high a percentage of recovery people in this church, I want to share something that's wild with you. There's a thing called the third step prayer. The third step in recovery is made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand him. And, and we know that Jesus is Lord. And here's the third step prayer. Just listen to how powerful this is. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and do with me as you will. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties so that victory over them may bear witness to those that I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. That's a third step prayer. And I would love it if you could just say that prayer once and be groovy. That might last about a half hour. You need to learn to live that prayer 
and l- try to live God's will every day and every moment of every day. God, what's your will? Help me to live your will uh, right now, right? And then the, the last step, well, why do we pray? Why do we pray for God's will? Here's what our life becomes all about for every real follower of Christ. We pray so that God gets the glory. Every one of your prayers should be, why are you praying this? For you? No. So that God gets the glory. Let me give you an example. One of the prayers right now, an area of my life I really need to improve in and would love to improve, is eating healthy and eating clean, right? And God, help me to eat healthy and clean, please, so that I will look buff and awesome. That's not the appropriate prayer. Father God, help me to get control of my eating, to eat healthy and clean, so that you may get all the glory, so that I may live long and healthy and be able to live for you. That's the appropriate prayer. God, save my marriage so that you may be glorified. And this is throughout the Bible, uh, 2 Thessalonians. We constantly pray for you that our God may count you worthy of his calling, that by his power he may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. We pray this so that the name of the Lord Jesus may be glorified in you. Same idea in John. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to his Father. So we learn as real followers, we humble ourselves, we begin to pray, and the real goal is to live our lives so that God gets the glory. And something crazy happens. When we begin to live our lives so that God gets the glory, we find the true meaning of life. And we never are more alive than when we're living giving God the glory. You're never at your best self, a better self, than when you're giving God the glory. And I'll give you an example of the, the, the thing that changed my life. It was such a simple, simple thing. I, I went to church, and I discovered God loved me, and he cared about my marriage. He began to heal our marriage, and I discovered God revealed all my sins are washed away. That's awesome. And then he revealed that I get to go to heaven. That's awesome. And, and God's awesome. But part of this is you're supposed to serve and live for him. So I signed up to serve. We've asked everybody in the church to serve because we want you to live for God. And the first thing that I did that changed my life was, it was around Christmas time, take a bag of groceries to a family that needs food in Piqua, Ohio. And I took a bag of groceries to a family in Piqua, Ohio. And when I left that house, I've never been the same. Because I never felt better about myself in my life. I just got to serve food in the name of Jesus. And it just, and I just wanted more and more and more. And that's what all of us should want. To live our lives so that God may be glorified. One final point here. Um, to review, pride always keeps you from God and God's best. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he'll lift you up. And we humble ourselves by, pry- by praying, seeking God's will in all we do so that he may be glorified. Now we get to the last point. You're going to have to forgive me. This last point is all I really planned on talking about today, all right? This right here is all I, the most important thing I want you to do. So if anything, please get this and apply this to your life. Here it is. There is no better way of glorifying God than praying with others. And that starts, there is no better way of glorifying God than praying with others with your family. So we should all cross the line where we learn to pray, to us and God, but where we learn to pray with others because we're called to be followers of Christ, to share his love with the world. So this is what changed my life. I came to church and, and yeah, I'd take these little baby steps of growing, which we should all be doing. And I knew that the men that I respected in church prayed with their families and spouses and maybe someday, But that's very uncomfortable, right? That's very uncomfortable. And what happened in this, and it just rocked my world, it happened at a a veterinarian's office. The first one was this. This is the second thing that my son pointed out in the message. He said, Dad, he said, say the part about may I be less and God be greater. And he said, you should say in this message that every man is called to be a spiritual leader of the house and a spiritual father. My 19-year-old son said that. And I'm like, oh, you're right. I'm, he's, he's climbing up on the review team. I'll tell you that much. That was good stuff. So we go to the vet's office, and um, 
um, the emergency vet on Dryden Road. And, and we, I think it was a dog. I think I know what dog it was. And I, they came out and said that um, it's time to put the dog down. Well, it was our whole family. And that, that was a dog when your kids were little. That's your dog. And they said, if you want to spend a little time, we understand. And we'll take care of everything. Okay. But kids, before we go back there, there's something that I'd like to do. And in the middle of the vet's office, we made a little circle, me and my four kids. And we held hands. And we prayed. And I said, God, I want to thank you so much for this dog. This has been great for our family. And God, I want to thank you for all you're doing in our family. And I know you're going to help us to heal together and we're going to be okay. And so we thank you. And we thank you for what you're doing in our family. And I was just praying. It's like, man, God has changed me. And that is such a beautiful thing to be able to pray with your family. And thank you, God, for giving me the courage to do that. There's nothing more manly than a husband praying with his wife. There is nothing more important for a father to do than pray with his daughter and teach her what a man of God, how, how to treat her. Nothing. Every man should pray with his sons and show them what a praying father looks like and teach them. And we should also pray wherever God leads us. We should be willing to pray. So this week, your challenge, I want you to pray with your spouse, all right? Every day, all right? Now, every service I get more specific, so stinks to be you, all right? Next, next service will be worse. But after last night, I thought, I didn't say how, so I want to show you how. I want to challenge today. We'll start tomorrow. Today we're going to pray together tomorrow. I want all the men to go to your wives anytime, simple, short, take your hand, just say, hey, honey, can I pray with you? Take your hand, touch her shoulder, hug, whatever. Father God, I want to thank you for my wife. I love her so much. I want to thank you for what you're doing in her marriage. I want to pray for her, help her to know how much she's loved. And God, I just want to lift her up. I pray this in Jesus' name. Just something simple like that. And then the next day, I want every wife to go to your husband, all right? And I know this is uncomfortable, but I want you to do this, and it is powerful. And I don't want you to not do this in your life. Second, I want you to pray with your children, all right? If you have kids, I want you to just pray with them. Just, I want you to be able to have that kind of relationship. And I want you to be willing to pray if God lays anybody on your heart. That's what it means to follow Christ. Um, and Isaiah it said, I, I heard a verse, voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send? And who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Here I am, send me. Every real follower of Christ should have that spirit. Here I am, God, send me. You got something that needs to be done? Here I am, send me. And whenever you feel led, God will lay something on your heart, and you need to follow the leading from God. Here I am, God, send me, and do whatever God lays on your heart. Pray whenever you feel uh, led. I just, uh, last Sunday, I shared with you, right after third service, I had to get on the road and go to Indianapolis and go to a viewing and a funeral, and my cousin's 18-year-old son died a horrible, tragic death. And so we, all of my kids went, and we took two cars and went over to Indianapolis. And when we got to the, to the church, it was worse than I thought it would be. To have an 18-year-old kid dead of tragic surgery, it really sucked. And there's my aunt and uncle who I love so much and waiting in line to hug them. And we just embraced for so long. I was so sorry. And um, later on, my uncle took us back into this little room and I said, Uncle Dale, what can we do for Matt and Sandy? What, what can we do for them? And here's what he said. He said, just follow the spirits leading, Mike. That was a powerful thing that he said right there. Just follow the Spirit's leading. So we took two cars because we're like, I don't know. We, this is family. We're not super close, but they're family. We used to be close. Haven't seen them in a while. I don't know if we should stay for the funeral tomorrow or, or go home tonight. So we, just, we packed the bag just in case. And as soon as we embraced the family and stuff, it was very clear to me. The Spirit of God is like, oh, you need to stay. You need to stay. So we stayed and spent some, some time, and it was awesome. That viewing got done. It ran over. It was a big deal and tiring. 
And then somebody mentioned something about coming over to the house, but we didn't really feel invited, and we did not want to intrude. And we were more than cool with that, so we're like, well, whatever, let's just go to the hotel. If they call, we'll go. Got about 8.15, nobody called, so it's like, we'll go get a pizza, we'll go to bed, and get up tomorrow and go to the funeral. And then about 8.30, they called. They're like, where are you at? We thought you were coming to the house. So we went to the house, and man, was it quality family time. And these people spent all of their time, they pulled up a chair and just sat with me and Tracy. And it's like, I'm so glad we stayed. I'm so glad we stayed. And then the next morning was the, the funeral. And um, I couldn't believe this so again. But my, my cousin said, Mike, can I talk to you a minute? And I'm like, yes. And he said, hey, um, I would like for you to be a pallbearer and represent our family. And I'm like, oh, I'm so glad we stayed. And then they had the, um, the family meals. Ah, we need to get on the road now. Spirit of God, no, you need to stay and be with this family a while. And we stayed, and I'm so glad we did. And now God's laying on my heart. Spirit of God, you should try to have a relationship and pour into him if you can, if he's willing this next year. And I hope to listen to the Spirit of God. The point is... The Spirit of God will lay things on your heart. And when he does, you are expected to say, here I am, God, I will go. So you're going to be out and God's going to lay on your heart weird stuff. You should invite them to church. Then you need to go. And say, I don't know why. I just feel led to come up and say, I know about this awesome church. Do you have a church home? If you're sharing someone's broken and hurting and you can feel, God, you need to pray with them. Uh, Let me pray with you. Whatever the Spirit says, there will be times you're like, well, I never give money to homeless people. You don't know. But for whatever reason, one in a hundred there, and the Spirit of God's like, you need to give that person ten bucks. Or then you listen to the Spirit of God always. Here I am, God. Send me. Um, we're not here to play church. We're here to grow and change and be mature followers of Christ. So I want to share this story with you. We'll get out of here. A couple years ago, probably more than a couple years ago, I did this message, and it was about praying, and about praying together as a family, and I said, I, I want to be a part of a church where everybody grows and changes, every husband's willing to pray with their wife, that's what it should mean to follow Christ, and every wife will pray with their husband, and we, we pray with our children, I, I want that for everybody, and I did this message, and the message got over, and there was a new couple and they were leaving, and I have this includer strength, so I chased them. And they were going out the front door, out that way, so I chased them out the front door. And um, I said, hey, I don't know if I know you guys. They're like, yeah, it's our first week here. I'm like, oh, I hope you felt welcome. I said, do you have a church home? And they said, ah, we're kind of working through that. We did, not really been growing lately. And I said, we're not about getting people from other churches, but I want you soaring for Christ and growing. And you should find a church and, and soar, man. And okay. And he said, well, I got you. Do you guys pray together? And they're like, no, not really. And I go, well, then let's just do it right now. And, we, and I was all fired up. I don't even know why I did this. You know what I mean? I'm not aware when I do this. And we right out in the front of the front parking lot. I said, right now. And we made a circle, and I said, go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead and pray. And she, go ahead and pray. And then we prayed, and that was the end of that. And I didn't worry about what I see him again because I was pretty sure I knew the answer to that one. And they came back the next week, and they're small group leaders in our church. And they've had a beautiful little kid that I guarantee you they pray with that kid and their key leaders. The reason they came back was they knew it meant something to follow Christ. And deep down, we all want to grow. We all want to be challenged to be the real deal and be real followers of Christ. And I want that for all of you. And I don't want any of you to have the family you love and not be growing and be willing to pray with them and have that kind of, of relationship in your family. And even to be able to listen to the Spirit of God wherever you go. I want all of you to walk through that and be the hands and feet of Christ. Will you stand? And I want to pray together. And right now, if you are so blessed to be with your family, someone you're dating, your, your child, go ahead and take their hand. 
the last service, there was a dad and a little girl about four years old, and they worshiped together, and he took her hand. I'm like, man, that what a great dad. Uh, God, we want to pray right now, and I pray that we would be families that pray together and grow together all the way to heaven, and that this would change generations. As we go through this week, help us to pray for a spirit of humility, that we may humble ourselves so you can lift us up. Help us to every day remember to pray, may we become less and make you greater and, and give you all the glory. This week, our challenge is to pray with our, our family every day and then to follow the leading of the Spirit. So God, if you lead us, give us the courage through the power of the Spirit to be your hands and feet and to say, here I am, God, send me. We love you and we thank you for Jesus. We pray these things in his name. Amen.